2019. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, when you're speaking, please use your microphones. Please, please bring them closer, uh, just because those who might be watching on the webcast or using assistive hearing devices wouldn't be able to hear otherwise, and watching us gesticulate and talk without the words probably isn't quite as meaningful, although possibly it might be. <laughs> I wouldn't like to comment. Uh, moving swiftly on to item 133, procedural business, declarations of substitutes. Are there any members in attendance to substitute today? Council Member Council Wills. Thanks, Joe, and welcome. Uh, any declarations of interest for any matters on the, arise on the agenda today? No, I see no indications. Uh, there are no part two items today which means that Gary can't take us into part two, no matter what he might wish to do. Um, item 134, minutes of the previous meeting, which is on page one of the agenda. Does the committee happy to approve that as an accurate record of the meeting? Thank you very much. Which takes us to item 135, Chair's Communications. So just to remind people that this will be broadcast live on webcast and capable of repeated viewing. Also to let people know that there will be a vigil outside the Town Hall at half past four today to express our condolences and solidarity uh, to those in New Zealand and around the world who've been facing a number of attacks uh, on Muslims and Muslim places of worship. Uh, we will be adjourning the meeting just before half past four so that we can all go out to attend should people wish to and we will come back in relatively swiftly after the end of the vigil if everyone's happy with that. Thank you very much. Um, just a few other items of Chair's communications. On, um, on the Whitehawk joint venture site, the Homes for Brighton and Hove Partnership Board met on Monday the 18th of March and agreed to stop progressing plans to develop more than 200 new affordable homes on the site in the north of Whitehawk. This followed a report identifying that the development of affordable housing would not be financially viable, which was something I think that I started to raise at the last PRNG, due to a number of access and technical difficulties on the site. Feedback from the public consultation and some local opposition expressing concerns about the environmental impact also of the proposals was discussed by the board. Landscape and ecology studies have shown that, with certain ecological mitigations in place, housing could be developed on the site without significant and adverse impacts on the local nature reserve. Plans for the first two homes for Brighton and Hove proposed developments in Portslade and in Coldine are progressing and further sites are being investigated. On the King Alfred development, officers have continued to work with Cress Nicholson to achieve the signing of the King Alfred development agreement as agreed at the last PRNG. Members will recall that we gave authorisation for officers to sign the development agreement, but due to Brexit uncertainty, Cress Nicholson were not in a position to give a definitive indication that they could sign, but they have even this week indicated that they are still willing and keen to sign. Uh, they wanted to be sure that the country is going to make an orderly exit from the EU before committing significant resources into the project. Uh, while members were sympathetic about the lack of Brexit certainty, and of course we still have a lack of Brexit certainty, we were clear that Cress needed to give a clear commitment so the project could move on and set a deadline of the 30th of March for the signing of the deal. Officers have been working hard with Cress Nicholson to finalise the documentation, while also reminding them again of the deadline to sign only last week. In the meantime, also keeping with the January resolution of the committee, officers have begun the work of looking at alternative options to take the project forward in the event that it cannot be progressed in its current form. Should that be the outcome, officers will bring an update to a future PR&G meeting early in the new administration and current progress was reported to the Strategic Delivery Board earlier this week on that. On the waterfront project, work has also been continuing with Aberdeen Standard Investments on the waterfront conditional land acquisition agreement, which was agreed by the committee back in December. The final version of all the documents have now been agreed, and the voluntary transparency, the VEAT notice, has now been issued. This notice is intended to protect the Council from future procurement challenge by being open and transparent about the form of the agreement with Aberdeen Standard Investments. 
Once the notice's 10-day period has expired on the 5th of April, the Council will be in a position to sign the agreement and start the process for what will be one of the most important developments in the City's recent history. And lastly, I'd just like to note that for at least two members of Policy Resources and Growth Committee, this is their last attendance at Policy Resources and Growth Committee. Uh, except, of course, you know, nominations haven't closed, so there's, there is no telling, but Councillor Sykes and Councillor Mitchell, ever since I've been uh, a councillor here, have been members of the Policy Resources and Growth Committee, both giving excellent service, paying great attention and detail, both to their own briefs, but to the overall work that PRNG does, and certainly great diligence in terms of going through what can be some quite dry documents, to be honest sometimes in great detail and willing to chase up and improve the work that's that's attempted to be done on behalf of the council so i'd just like to thank you both for supporting the work of pr and g it gets the council's work done and i expect to see you both in the public gallery after may <laughs> Oh, and Andrew's, Andrew as well, but Andrew isn't here, to, isn't here today. But yeah, and Andrew similarly has given sterling service to the committee and is one of those people that you can guarantee to have noticed even the smallest detail. So we're going to be absolutely reliant on you, Gary, in the future, going forward when it comes to detail. That takes us to item 136, the call over. So I now ask the Democratic Services Officer to undertake the call over. Oh, just to, just to let you know, just the last, last part of Chair's comms, item 144 was included in error. That was an item that wasn't supposed to be coming forward to this committee and had been agreed to be removed. Uh, and so item 144 has been withdrawn. So we'll move to 136. Call over. Thank you, Chair. Uh, call over. Item 139, Pay Policy Statement 2019-20. Item 140, IT Investment. Item 141, Annual Planned Maintenance Budget. Item 142, Educational Capital Resources and Capital Investment Programme. Item 143, Customer Experience Strategy 2019. Item 145, Unpaid Trial Shifts. Item 146, the Local Digital Declaration. Item 147, Microsoft Enterprise Subscription Agreement Renewals. Yeah. Item 148, 2019-20 Local Transport Plan Capital Programme. Is that cool? Is that cool? Yes. Item 149, Homeless Move On Hollingbury Library Proposals. And item 150, Sustainability and Carbon Reduction Investment Fund. So for confirmation, the items called are items 140, 141, 142, 147, 148, 149 and 150. Thank you very much, which takes us to item 137, public involvement. We have no petitions from members of the public. Uh, we do have one written question from Ms V Painter, which is included on page 15 of the agenda. Ms Painter, would you like to come forward and ask your question? Councillors at Policy Resources and Growth have, at some length, complained about and questioned the progress of the King Alfred Development Agreement. It prompts the question in my mind, 
After bids are awarded, how long should it take to formulate, agree, and sign a development agreement? Thank you very much for that question. A very, a very apposite one, considering how things have gone. So the procurement regulations themselves do not specify the length of time which can be spent settling an agreement following the conclusion of a competitive dialogue procedure. The length of time it takes, therefore, depends on the circumstances of the project and the extent to which there are outstanding matters at the conclusion of the dialogue. At the time of Cress Nicholson's selection, back in 2016, it had been hoped that the development agreement would be entered into within a six-month period. Uh, this was known to be a challenging timetable for such a complex project as the King Alfred, but one that both parties were keen to achieve. Unfortunately, financial viability problems prevented this. Since that time, the Council and Cress Nicholson have worked to address these challenges, culminating in the December 2018 and January 2019 reports to PR&G, uh, through which the 30th of March 2019 deadline for signing the development agreement was agreed. Would you like to ask a supplementary question? Just as a flyer, um, any lessons learned about this very long period and how things might have been done differently? I think it's fair to say that there's, there's nobody on the council who's particularly pleased with the length of time that it's taken to get to this point. You know, the council would have sought to have entered into the development agreement far in advance of this and by this point would have expected to have been through a significant amount of public engagement and hopefully have been in, in the position where planning was at least being applied for, if not found, so that the development could start. I think my greatest lesson is don't enter into any, any, anything that's going to be ultimately reliant on the decision of a Conservative government during a Brexit period. Thank you. That moves us to deputations from members of the public, of which we have none. <clears throat> so now I'm going to um, enter onto item 138, member involvement, petitions. Um, I have one petition which was referred from full council on the 31st of January, which I presented. Uh, so at this point I'm going to start talking to myself. You carry on and uh, I'll give myself my response. I, I'll try to keep it brief and I might not have to repeat myself. Uh, thank you very much. Oh yeah. This, this will be surreal. Thank you for the petition regarding the concerns relating to road safety in the, in the location of the existing waste and recycling depot. And it's worth remembering 1,200 people signed this, so I'm not just speaking to myself. Um, I'm pleased to inform myself that road safety officers have identified this location, has a good road safety record, and there have been no reported accidents or concerns. However, I have asked officers to continue to monitor this location and report any issues that may arise. If you, stroke I, have any further concerns regarding road safety at this location, they can be reported to council officers at email address or directly to Operation Crackdown, which is continu continually monitored by Sussex Police on web address. Um, we are aware that the KSD Environmental Limited Depot forms part of the site known as One Morscombe Way. McLaren Property is presently consulting local residents about a new development proposal that would see the KSD operation vacating the site. This proposal would need to be subject of a planning application before it could be implemented. The Council, as local planning authority, would carry out its own consultation as part of any planning application, and residents would be invited to make their views known at that stage in the process. However, the City Council does not have power to force companies to move off of a site unless that use has not been authorised through the planning system. For that reason, locating, relocating would be a matter for KSD to decide. However, the City Council would always be willing to offer to work with them to offer advice if they did wish, if wish to relocate to another site within the Greater Brighton City region. You'd be pleased to know I don't have the right of reply to myself. Um, so I'm going to ask, do the committee agree to note the petition? Thank you very much. Which then takes us to written questions, and we have one written question received from Councillor Sykes. Councillor Sykes, would you like to read your question, please? 
Um, um, thank you very much, Chair. I'm, uh, I'm not going to read it now. As I'm just going to sort of say, say a couple of things about it. And uh, we, you have provided uh, us with a, a written response, which I'm uh, very grateful for. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this relates to, to Budget Council. Budget Council is a big political event, apart from anything else. So political point scoring is about resource allocation. But I mean, what, what, I mean, our, our intention at Budget Council was to make a genuine difference to services. So that was the rationale behind this question, was to uh, go into a bit more detail after Budget Council to find out what the plans were given um, the, these resource allocations. And that there are also some uh, complexities in a couple of the items because, uh, for example, the council car parking I understand needs to go through the IRP and so there, there are issues, issues like that so um, yeah we, it's great that we've got the, the report on the sustainability item so I didn't, um, yeah, I, did, I didn't include that in this list but I mean um, referring to the written response given I, I would just like to clarify a couple of points so on the library um, uh, amount that went in, 121,000 back into libraries. Uh, uh, the question is whether the original proposition of eight staff uh, cut is going to be reduced to four, or is there a different way through that? Um, and on the um, 31,000 to the community safety team and the 33,000 to the city centre fund, are those two items? Um, pretty much guaranteed to go forward or are they dependent on resolution of um, where that money is coming from for example so, so those complexities I wanted to uh, get an answer to and just to get some certainty on um, in particular the library item thank you very much okay fine I'll look to Larissa to answer the library's question and then we'll ask Max to answer the questions about the city environmental services if that's okay. Um, the simple answer is it's not as simple as H4. Um, what we have done is we have um, in some of the re reductions were people's hours, where their hours have been reduced or they were on lower hours anyway, and we've been able to increase their hours. Um, the staff that have left or are leaving were all staff that um, requested or applied for voluntary severance, and we took the decision not to stop any of that as we had the ability to make up hours by increasing uh, part-time um, staff uh, to, to more full-time staff. Um, where we've made some changes and cut some, some funding, we've put those back. We've also put an amount in to cover um, uh, an increased uh, amount for casual staff so we have some staff that are part-time and happy to be part-time but are happy to do additional hours and we have a budget for that so whilst we've increased the FTE equivalent we've increased the hours that the library service is operating it's not as simple as we've put four people back in we've done it through um, working with the teams to increase other people's hours um, and giving people additional days if they were part-time and Max? Okay, so on the um, question around uh, City Clean, the funding of £22,000 for logistical support, um, the resources will allow us to work with universities to tackle the problem of fly tipping when students vacate through education. Uh, consideration could be given to fund a social enterprise or community group as well to, um, to maximise the reuse of unwanted furniture and belongings. So we'll be, we'll be looking at that. Uh, on the £33,000 uh, recurring fund to keep the city centre look, looking its best, um, those, resource, those resources are going to enable the council to continue to support um, community clean-up initiatives uh, which improve the look of the city and help bring communities together. It will also give the council scope to increase the budget um, allocated for weed removal and give consideration to the use of emerging technologies for that. Okay, and I've also, I've also got Dave looking at, this is your supplementary already, Ollie, I'm afraid. Uh, so I'm going to ask Dave to come in and then I'll just cover off a couple of extra things as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, just to confirm that in the first TVM report that we bring back here, we'll confirm exactly what's happened with these budgets and uh, if there's any changes to these plans. So there will be transparent reporting um, further down the line as we go into the new financial year. 
Yeah, I think it's, it is important to say that obviously the changes that are made at budget, we are only the resource allocation side of things rather than a specific change to service plans for the for the 2019-20 period. We're not even into 2019-20, so we need to get we need to get a little bit closer to it to be able to be able to identify exactly what these extra additional resource allocations are going to be able to deliver, although obviously the intention is very clear from here as to roughly where those services are going to be enhanced and improved compared to where they were. Well, you're the, the I mean, my, my, sorry, thank, thank, thanks, Chair. I mean, I suppose my, my thank, thanks for the officer's response. I suppose my, my question was uh, the extent to which these uh, amounts are sort of guaranteed in terms of their use because there are complexities about where the money comes from. But um, I, I take the point about following it in TBM, and that's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, at that point. Chairman, Council Sykes referred several times. Thank you for the original response which you've been given in advance of the meeting. We don't seem to have that in response to the public statement. We'll make sure that that public response is available on the website. We have had a, a, a slight issue with getting papers onto the website, and I'm, I'm afraid that that's, that has caused a few people a little bit of discomfort and issue. But there's a, there's a set of papers coming towards you right at the moment, Richard. <laughs> Okay, at that point, I'm going to suspend the meeting because if we get into the next item, we won't get very far at all. Uh, so we'll come back as soon as the vigil outside is completed. Thanks very much. And thank you very much for what turned out to be quite an extensive adjournment. Uh, and just an additional item of chairs comms, actually. Um, the issue that I mentioned about the... Sorry. <laughs> yes, if everyone can remember to put their phones on silent. <laughs> it turns out that we may have a, a minor issue with publishing agendas online for the next couple of days. So especially a notice to the press, please don't please don't be surprised if that's an issue. It may be useful if you if you have particular agendas you need to get hold of to email in and ask for them to be emailed out to you in the meantime. It's just a, a minor change that seems to have crashed everything. Yeah, so moving on, IT investment, item 140. Uh, yeah, no, so moving on, item 140, IT investment, which I believe Dave Koonsberg is going to be introducing and apologising for everything, obviously, at the same time. Uh. Obviously, there is a high need for continued investment in the IT in this council. Um, right, so this, this paper is, um, as, as was suggested, the, the Policy Resources and Growth Committee before budget, that we wanted to come here with um, a, a more of an exposition on what our IT strategy was going forward, because at Budget Council, uh, members chose to um, accept a high-level proposition uh, based on the assertion that we are in the throes of probably in year two of stabilising um, what, what, what has been a difficult um, IT service. Um, and as we move into year three, uh, we have got an investment proposition here, which we believe will continue to do that and start to put us on a very firm footing uh, going forwards. And we're kind of catching up, our benchmark really is catching up with our Orbis partners, which we are now doing uh, in no small part thanks to the expertise which that partnership has afforded us. Um, our, our IT lead is here um, in off leave, which I'm very grateful for. So Dan Snowden will give you a very quick overview, and then he and I will answer any questions on the report. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, as Dave said, I'll just give a very quick, uh, quick overview, and then I'm um, happy to field any questions. Uh, so as Dave touched on there, IT and D have been working with all of partners for um, at least 18 months now, and during this time we've been working hard to repair some of the technical debt that's caused, been caused by a period of um, underinvestment in IT. Uh, in the current financial year, 
We've uh, had a program in place called the Digital Organization Program, which is uh, focused on putting in place some underlying technical capabilities to support more digital ways of working. Uh, this has effectively been um, fixing some of the most uh, significant issues connected to what you could describe as the sort of underlying plumbing of, of IT, and those are listed in uh, Section 3.2 of the document. Um, as we're moving into year two, we're aiming to shift the focus from some of that underlying uh, infrastructure, although there are still elements that we will need to continue working on, uh, to changes that will positively impact um, users and support the continued shift to digital ways of working that were initiated by the Digital First program. The paper outlines these areas for, um, from section 3.21, um, but effectively they are, some, as I say, a, a small amount of continued work on foundational IT. Um, but the largest areas of investments are to support mobile working and develop the digital offer to customers. Uh, I think the other significant point of the paper is that uh, we're asking for delegated authority for the Executive Director of Finance and Resources to award contracts for the laptop device and deployment service. This will enable us to move at the pace that we need to to, uh, to procure along with our partners in Surrey and East Sussex County Councils and put us in the strongest position to get uh, best value from that contract. Um, and significantly, we will, it will enable us to work at the pace that we need to to deploy those devices, bearing in mind the, um, the deadline of February 2020. Uh, Thank you. Okay, I've seen Ollie indicate. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, I, yeah, we've got, got, got some concerns about this um, paper. I suppose it, I mean, it links to the it clearly links to the um, Windows 7 to Windows 10 change, and um, we've, we've got an amendment in on item 147. Um, so that sort of links to um, some, some questions that we have about this. And I suppose I mean the, the basic question is around the wholesale move to. Um, laptops in, in, my, in my other work environment, um, the, the IT response to individual staff uh, requirements is, is, is based on that and, and not on, on, on sort of wholesale provision of laptops. So there are issues associated with laptop provision, which are security, you can lose them, they can break. Um, there are other solutions uh, that don't even involve desktops. You have sort of desk-based terminals, which, which don't require the same sort of expense as, as laptops. So, yeah, I, mean, I would like um, a bit more information about that and um, yeah, whether there aren't, yeah, do we need this wholesale move to purchasing 4,000 laptops at enormous expense. Um, we'll come to the concerns about Microsoft in the later paper. <laughs> Um, so as, as, as the paper sort of illustrates that the, the, in very broad terms what we're talking about is um, around of the 5,000 uh, users in the organization roughly we currently have around uh, 2,000 that are using laptops. Um, there are about 3,000 that are using desktops. Uh, we are showing that as, as both says to about uh, as, and as you've come to 4,000 around 4,000 users to moving to laptops and retaining around 1,000 desktops. Um, so, really, either the investment difference is, is sort of relatively small. Um, so, we are adding around 3, uh, 350,000 to achieve that, that switch. So, it's, it's a relatively small amount to allow us to move to laptops. The advantage of moving to laptops is the mobility that that provides uh, staff. Um, but it also allows us a much more flexible way of using buildings. And if we are to uh, move buildings around in the future, it, uh, a laptop estate is far easier to move than, uh, than a desktop estate. Okay, Dave, I've, I've seen Dave indicate as well on this one. Um, I think the other, the other key point is that the, it, it's not just about um, trying to create a, a more options for mobile work and that sort of thing. The whole estate has to be renewed, whether we stayed with de desktops or laptops because of the Windows, the Windows 10 issue. So our current platforms um, basically run out of road in February 2020. So, so that that's the key uh, underpinning for a lot of the investment decision here. Failure. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have pretty similar um, concerns to uh, Councillor Sykes. Um, my specific question, and it, it seems to have gone off the boil a little bit, but there was one stage where 
um, the latest quantity of laptop thefts from government departments seem to do the rounds in an awful lot of the media. And I'm, I'm just wondering, is, are there assurances in this strategy that, so I, I take your point, that on the one hand, to, um, to move to work styles, to have more mobile staff, to have people who are able to work flexibly and so on, that is the driver for some of this, but then are we mitigating the necessary risks that come as a result of it? So I can't be the only person who's seen um, council officers sort of wading around outside um, with laptops. So I can't be the only one concerned um, about what sort of insurance policies, real, real and um, institutional, corporate, I suppose, that, that we're going to... Um, that we're going to encounter to, to overcome what we what we have in terms of losses, um, and are, are we recording losses as well as they happen? Thanks. Um, I, I don't have figures at the moment on on, um, on losses that we've uh, that we've had with, with current the current laptop estate, but um, I'm not aware of them as being as being significant at all. Um, what we do have in place is uh, hard drive encryption across all laptops. So, um, in terms of the actual the information assets, um, that is is um, relatively secure. Uh, the the device itself, I, as I say, I can't go and got figures on, on uh, losses that we've had, but they are they are fairly minimal, so, as far as I'm aware. Sorry, can I just come back on that? Then I suppose it's one thing to have the figures and not have the figures. I suppose if we are going to have lots more of these things, it's going to be far more likely that we will suffer losses or we will suffer theft. So do we have a proactive policy in place to ensure that having bought all these laptops, if a higher than normal percentage get lost or get broken or get stolen, um, that there'll be something there that means that, that, that we, you know, guess the information is one thing, but I'm talking about the, the, the actual, um, the actual uh, infrastructure itself. Uh, it's, it's not something that we have in place at the moment. A particular kind of uh, reporting around around devices, we we um, we will collect those figures as and when um, those incidents are reported to us. But it's not something that we're reporting back to the organisation on that, and that is something we could change as part of this uh, this programme where we can start reporting on um, devices that are stolen and lost. Yeah. I've seen Tony and then Joe. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> but certainly, we've had various briefings on this, um, but this, this paper does make me nervous. I, I think the, um, we've had certainly paragraph 36, underinvestment has been a contributing factor. I think underinvestment has happened in this, across the council for many years. We've got a lot of old IT, and you only have to go and ask members to know that we've always got connection problems or IT problems, and the, the poor IT department, IT department's always running around. So that must be a very similar position across the council. But this, I think this all-or-nothing approach, I am getting very nervous about it. If you look through the paper, um, 5.418 million, certainly digital first. We, we had a paper to the members' oversight, and I know... And Reem and her team look at it very carefully, and I think 500 odd thousand pounds were spent without any cashable benefits. I'd like to know where some of that money was spent, and where are the lessons learned from that? We, we, you can't spend a half a million pounds and have no cashable benefits, and then suddenly produce a paper like this where you want to spend, you want to give authority for five million pounds. This paper does make me very nervous. I agree with all the principles. There is a historic underinvestment, sure, there is a cyber threat, a big cyber threat coming up. GDPR, um, it talks about GDPR on laptops, but we're also purchasing, I think, housing, IT systems, the new replacement for the mayor's contract will be IT, adult social care, I think, will need a, children's will need a new system. GDPR, where is that coming in? Is this just the laptops within the council? How are we integrating the systems? Where's the money for that? Um, then we, we go upgrading the foundation IT across the council. Well, the foundation IT, I believe a lot of it is now re residing in Surrey or on the cloud, um, and that isn't made very clear in this paper. I, I think um, certainly the IT people who work in the council are very disappointed with the way that the, I think the three levels of maintenance have, have been distributed across the Orbis network, and uh, it certainly shows that we're not getting as much support. Um, ongoing investment into mobile supporting. Uh, councils are mobile by the very nature because they work in their wards. Um, that, that, that certainly needs to be invested in. So 
my problem with this paper is we're, we're giving authority to somebody to spend over £5 million in the capital budget, and I don't know enough, I'm afraid. This, there should be more briefings, more talking about how the various IT systems across the council are going to be integrated, and the thought of buying thousands of laptops in one contract, I don't know any organisation across the university that would do that. By the time you've rolled them all out, some of them are bound to be um, obsolete. This is, I don't think this is, this is the way to do it, and, and I'm afraid... We weren't asked. I know you, you've come to leaders group a, a while back, but certainly not this proposal. It, to buy this many laptops and to integrate at once, um, we all learn by these massive IT problems. I just don't think this is going to work. Um, so I'm, I don't want to give authority to the executive director to spend that money because I'm simply not sure where that money's going to go, where the money's gone in the past, uh, where the money's been spent on um, uh, improvements and uh, no cash flow benefits. I, I don't think I can actually vote for this tonight unless I can get some guarantee that a lot more briefings and a lot more subpapers are going to come to this, the first PNR in the new year of the, the council because I simply do not know where all this money is going and where it's coming from. Thanks. I think I'll get Dave Koonsberg to explain where the money is coming from. So the, the, the money was allocated at the budget. Um, I take the, the points made. Um, we this obviously went to uh, leaders group, but that is that was a one-off um, presentation. Um, we have there's quite a lot of officer scrutiny over this, but I understand that, that we can do more for members. Possibly a way through this as we build the more detailed plans for what we're going to buy and when and maybe we bring that to members oversight or, or, or similar um, individual briefings are fine the, the, a lot of the big spend here is because we do fall off a cliff in February 2020 and that's why we would contract uh, you know do quite a big contract because we're basically replacing the, the entire, an awful lot of the the IT estate by that point to cope with the window, the need to upgrade to Windows. A lot of the stuff set out here in the report is about the, the benefits that Windows would bring. The comments around the other systems are right, so the housing system and the social care system um, are both around about 20 years old and are not offering uh, the sort of modern functionality that um, the services need to provide services in a, in a sensible way. I know more about the social care system one, um, where you, you just can't get the right information out of it in order to run the, the social care systems as effectively as one, one would expect in this day and age. And they also don't sponsor digital and mobile working for our social workers, those systems. I think most of those uh, sort of deficits are, are, the, are the same on the housing side. Um, the, the ask for delegation it doesn't need to be approved it, 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 in that we can, we, we, we can come back any time uh, there's a spend over £500,000 as we would do anyway. Uh, all procurements, apart from the one at the end about the licensing, uh, we, we can come back and do more work with members uh, if, if, that, if there is more assurance required. So if that's the, if that's a concern, then you know really happy to be uh, provide more details. This is an overall strategy paper, uh, trying to set out what what we've got planned uh, for for the year ahead and subsequent years. Uh, we know it's quite high level on the numbers, um, so happy to you know work with members however, however they want. The later paper, I would just say, well, I'll say it when we get to it, that is more time critical because the Microsoft licenses are due to fade out shortly. Yeah, you know, I can't think there's many more important things than getting the IT right across the council because everything will run from it. I mean, even just going from Windows 7 or even XP, I suppose, in some places, and I do even believe that you're still hiring people to write Unix scripts, which means you've got some really old systems knocking around somewhere. But the, the one thing you can say about Windows 10 is when you start to introduce it, people need training, and I don't see any training budget in here. There's going to be an awful lot of gotchas with utilities that people use um, where they won't... Windows 10 just has some problems with, with old versions, I don't know, of Excel or whatever. I know we're coming on to the, the Windows thing later, but, but it's... Can, can, 
I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm going to vote for this paper, but I might allow it to go through by abstaining. But can I have assurances from both the, the chair and officers that the first P&R in the, in the new, after the election, that they come back and, and have a, a more detailed explanation of how th this will be integrated within the council? Because it, this does not say how you're going to integrate the IT system within the council. And, and certainly, when I'm at group meetings and I have councils asking me these questions, I simply don't know the answers from this paper. So if I can have that guarantee, maybe I will abstain and allow it to go through, but I certainly can't vote for it. I'm going to have to ask the officers to give you that assurance, Tony, because there's no guarantee that either you nor I will be here at the next PRG meeting. Yeah. Sorry, through the chair, yes. I mean, we'll, we'll guarantee the right level of briefing to give members assurance that there's absolutely no doubt about that. Okay, so, so can we, David, can we, can we just be assured that there will be an appropriate answer, you know, sort of, a, and, and reported public report coming through about how, how this is going to be addressed, rather than it just being done through briefing, that members of the public don't get assurances? Yes, absolutely, members and the public. Um, there may be some time-critical elements um, of this, which we'll, we will... We may have to do on urgency powers, but the, the, the most time critical bit is the, the, the later paper in the agenda. Um, I was just make a point that um, perhaps it wasn't it wasn't um, entirely clear in the paper, but um, even if we stayed with the because a lot of the questions are around sort of the laptop piece, even if we stayed with the current like for like um, estates, so if we were just to replace the um, laptops and desktops to, in order to be able to run Windows 10, um, we still would be spending just 350 thousand short of the uh, of the figure that we're asking for here. So that would, that in itself would cost um, going off at 2.7. Million just to replace the the, the, uh, the existing estate in order to run Windows 10, um, and we do have a, a, a drop out um, with Windows 10 that um, we've got to move from Windows 7 by February 2020. So we have a year in which to to replace the, the estate. By adding that 350,000, it just gives us the opportunity to be able to um, uh, to work with more with a, a kind of mobile workforce. So it's a it's a small, relatively small investment in order to change the way that we're working. Can I, can, can I just say that is the point I'm making? Not that I don't think that this is deliverable in its, its overall sort of outline sense. I think that when you start looking at the detail, I think you're going to come back to us and ask for more money. That's what I'm worried about. Well, uh, I did, you know, a lot of work's gone into this. Um, we can provide more detail. Certainly not the intention to come back for more money. We're absolutely aware this is a big investment to, to get us back onto the right, you know, to get us on to, to right the ship, really, after what's, what's been a bit of a patchwork set of IT services up to, up to recently. OK, I'm going to move on. I've seen Joe, then Emma, then Gary. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just, I, I take it that laptops, because of what you just said, if you would like for like replacement of the current state, it's more expensive to buy laptops, which I, I'm, I would have thought desktops are more expensive, but I take it that laptops are by that. Um, yeah. Um, the, the, uh, the second question is, um, in this um, reinvestment in the, in, the, in the new IT estate, what future proofing? I don't, what I wouldn't want to see is we come, you know, Windows change their programs in a couple of years' time, and then we have to replace the entire estate again because it's not future-proofed. So that will form part of the. Well, Windows do it. In, well, Microsoft do that intentionally because they've got a monopoly, and therefore they can they can they do that. Um, so that's one question. What, how's that going to factor in? And also on on page 38.3.5. Uh, so this equates to an average spend per employee on IT of £692. But then in Appendix 3, page 49, it says £2,950 per employee. So I didn't know how much we spend per employee. Just two contrasting figures. I didn't know whether that was divided by all, whether there's a difference between employees of a council or employees that have access to the IT. I'll let everyone pause to catch up with you on that, Joe. I can see them flicking through papers as we speak. 
well, one of them is flicking through papers, the other one seems a bit more IT savvy, which is a relief, to be honest. Um, in terms of the figures, the, the, the correct figure is the one in Appendix 3. Apologies for that. Um, but in terms of the future proofing, um, the way Windows will now be operating is uh, it, it, rather than sort of the releases that they've done in the past as Windows 7 um, to Windows 10 to be, Windows 10 they're intending to, um, to now con do continual release um, on the Windows 10 product. So it will be continual, uh, a continual update of a sort of Windows 10. So it operates in much the same way as you would have um, your iPhone. Um, so it's a continual improvement of the, of the operating system rather than a, another step change that there has been before. Um, so are the laptops future proof? Um, they are a specification that will run the Windows 10 as is, um, and we'll be looking to sort of make sure that, that, is, that there is a sort of a, a, a a degree of um, sort of contingency within that to allow for future updates and to allow for the applications of, that we're running. Um, so we're confident that they will last for um, the expected period of sort of four to five years for a laptop at most. Um. I mean, the other thing we, we need to do when we build the, hopefully, the new administration will want to adopt a four-year medium-term financial strategy, because that's the sensible thing to do, is rather than having investment and then very small uh, sort of levels of investment across the pieces, you try and level the spend out. So we would create um, an IT reserve that we top up on an annual basis, and then that allows you to do investment over time rather than big spikes in investment like what we're having to do this time. Because, because, yeah. Okay, Joe, did you want to come back on the other point? Yeah, the comment that, it, you know, Microsoft say that now, but they might change their mind, you know, commercial operator. Okay, Emma. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just first wanted to make some comments about Digital First and um, the programme benefits. Um, so Digital First was really, a, it, you know, it wasn't just a digital programme, but a system pro programme that looked across how um, we could improve and make easier uh, transactions that you needed to do with the council. And so um, they were, they ended up being a lot deeper than I think what anyone envisaged, partly because the digital agenda in the public sector, we've probably been just overall too slow to understand the, the benefits there. Um, I just wanted to say around the non-cashable benefits, um, one of the projects, for example, that the school that they did with school admission, there's going to be very little cashable benefit in filling in one set of forms for school admissions to another set of forms for school admissions. But there is a huge, huge public benefit to the new system, which is so straightforward, and I've had so much good feedback on, for example. So whilst digital first did and shall and will, and I think the IT programme as well, unlock resources. They're not always going to unlock resources. Sometimes the point of it is just to make things better for the people who live in the city. And on that basis, I just would like to say that I don't want to see them dismissed as benefits because people actually value those things. Um, and, and the feedback I've had from community sector about the online application process for grants has been hugely positive and if more people are applying for grants and they are from a wider range of organizations and they are and they're being successful that's a success in itself it doesn't necessarily mean that we can cash that um, I think just some observations and positive uh, positivity about moving towards laptops and I think they've made an ob 
you know, an observable difference in meetings where when we're having meetings and information is required, people are easily able to access that. They don't have to go away and find it and come back on another day. So it means that the business of the um, organisation can be conducted in a more uh, efficient manner. The other thing that I think is really useful about laptops is that it means that people don't have to return to base to write notes, to do actions, but they can do them where they are. And that improves the quality of life for our workforce, but also I think it um, provides an efficiency for the public as well. So for me, moving to laptops is, is better. If anything, I think that the, if there's something that we need to think about from a workforce perspective, it's the temptation to work longer than you should because you have your laptop with you. And I think we have to, uh, I know, I know that we're all at this level um, and offices that maybe we at a senior level email are emailing and working into the late evenings on a regular basis we have to make sure that that is not an embedded culture that becomes normal because it that isn't healthy so we need the benefits of the laptops but with an, a mind um, to the health of the workforce as well thank you Gary Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, yes, I, 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 actually I'm in agreement with the report for its aims, but I, I would just like, please, if I may, to ask a couple of questions, because the recommendation 2-1 approves the inclusion of 5.418 million pounds. Very precise. Um, if we go to Appendix 4, it's very nice to see that we've already built in a £500 contingency because we only reckon we're going to spend 5417500. So that's very good housekeeping having a contingency. But the very first lines, line at the top of the appendix says note that all costs are indicative and based on initial market analysis. So I think I, I, I feel I've got a slight feeling of doubt because that's a, a, a lovely caveat to be able to point to when we find that maybe um, the budget will be quite a bit more. I have no reason to say that it will be more, but I do think there's a jolly good um, savings clause there. The reason I'm saying that is that are we totally confident that you know this is more than indicative? It's probably fairly certain because on page 43 paragraph 3.40 contracts will include the initial provision of between three and a half and four thousand laptops now that's quite a range is the range there simply so therefore if the budget does come in more we go to the lower number of laptops you know that that would be my thought there because if so what is in fact the necessary amount of laptops is three and a half the, min the minimum and is four thousand really being a hopeful figure okay so i can see dave dave keen keen to ask about answer those questions gary i'm guessing part of it part of the answer is going to be about what a framework supplier cost looks like so um we have quite a lot of market power because we buy, buy a lot of certs, uh, goods and services with Orbis partners which gives us more scale. Um, we're fairly confident in these numbers that that, that initial market analysis is, is initial but we're quite savvy now on, on how we buy our IT so I wouldn't expect these numbers to, to necessarily go up. The range in laptops is partly due to the analysis, detailed analysis we still need to do to, and, and this was something that Councillor Sykes mentioned about what do people actually need. So we're not going to buy um, a load of laptops for a team who come into work, sit in the same desk all day, that's what they do, and then they go home. If there's no mobile need or benefit, we won't be doing that. Uh, we won't be buying them a more expensive piece of kit. But for most roles, the role profiles uh, do have benefits uh, for staff if, if they can be a bit more mobile. Another thing we're saying, which isn't uh, in here yet, but it, we're definitely going to factor it into the medium-term financial strategy, we're going to put pressure on um, our managers to be very clear about the productivity benefits that mobile working brings. So, um, Rob Percy and Pinky Goshell have long talked about uh, the productivity gains that social workers will have, for example, 
by being able to do their work from uh, a much broader set of locations and having to go back to the office and either have an admin person type in casework um, that they may well, uh, a lot of them may well prefer to do that themselves. So those productivity savings are not yet uh, factored into budgets, but we know we're going to have to make savings uh, after next year, the last year of our four-year plan, and that is a place that the Section 151 officer will, will 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 be going because we don't just give people we don't give people new kit like sweeties. We give them it for a reason. Um, so, so there's two important points there, I think, in response to what Councillor Peltzer Dunn's raised and what Councillor Sykes raised earlier. Gary, I'm guessing you might want to come back. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm very grateful for that. I'm grateful for the um, very detailed answer, which I, I can appreciate. I would have think that there is a degree of doubt regarding scope and, and monies, etc. And I'd have thought maybe a new administration would probably very much welcome, you know, a, 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 shall we say, a follow-up report, just to uh, so members can be kept in touch, whoever they might be. That sounds entirely appropriate to me. Um, Steve, I saw you indicate, and I think that's the last person that I've seen, so. Thank you, Chair. It wasn't what I felt left out of the debate, but um, it was just something which um, I'm afraid David said, which made me question um, something, and I'd just like to ask this. Uh, I accept all the arguments or points, interest of what's come from the officers. I just want to know how much of our decision is influenced by um, all this, Surrey, and how much of this is really um, of our own leading. So what I'm really asking, are we leading on this or are we being led? Uh, so Orvis is a, a partnership um, across three councils. We have equal votes on that, so we have two members on the joint committee. Uh, we have, in, in officer terms, we lead to that, we have equal votes. I'm one of three. Um, and that actually means we, we've got more influence than our budget or the, our number of employees or our size would, would actually dictate. Um, in terms of how we've come up with the proposals, there is no doubt that we have had a lot of support um, and leadership from elsewhere uh, in Orbis, if you were to be location specific. But actually, um, the skills that Orbis has brought us, and by Orbis I just mean other officers in the partnership, um, has, has given us a, a much better chance to come up with business plans like this that we believe will, will succeed. In the past, we weren't making uh, great business plans and great decisions on how we invested IT because I don't think we did have the skills. Um, in terms of uh, a Surrey influence over this or an East Sussex influence over this, there is there is none. It is a, uh, a, de a decision taken by this council based on expert advice from w wheresoever it may come. We have experts residing in Brighton. The leader is based in East Sussex, but he is a uh, shared resource across all three councils. And, and as such, it is not another sovereign body who is making this proposed decision. It is your set of officers. But where, wherever the advice comes from. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm going to move to a vote on the recommendations on 2.1 and 2.2 .2 on page 37. All those in favour, please show. All those against? All those abstaining? Excellent, thank you very much. That's passed. That takes us to item 141, the Annual Planned Maintenance Budget and Asset Management Fund Allocations 2019-20 for the Council's Operational Buildings, which doesn't even have a short acronym. Um, and Angela, I think you're going to be introducing this. Yes, sorry about the snappy title. The report seeks approval for the programme of works and allocations of property annual revenue and capital budgets agreed at February Budget Council and grants delegated authority to the director to procure and award contracts within these budgets in accordance with contract standing orders. The revenue budget of 3.298 million relates to those operational buildings where the council has a pairing liability and excludes council housing, highways and educational establishments which have their own budgetary provisions. 
The Council's building maintenance strategy, part of the Council's corporate property strategy and asset management plan, sets out how we manage the required maintenance of our assets within the context of our corporate landlord model, reducing budgets and smarter procurement, and is the basis used for prioritising and setting the annual programme of works. Appendices 2 and 3 contain the pro proposed prioritised annual budgets and programmes of work a summary of which can be found in the body of the report. The Asset Management Fund forms part of the Council's capital strategy and is a £1 million capital fund managed by property to support property improvements, property-related health and safety requirements and access improvements under the Equality Act 2010. The report seeks approval to the 2019-20 allocations set out in paragraph 3.4 and detailed at Appendix 4. It includes a breakdown of the reprioritized work styles program, important health and safety improvements to two major operational buildings and property-related health and safety and Equality Act requirements. Failure to maintain and improve our building stock conform to building-related health and safety and other statutory legislation will increase risks, inhibit service deliver delivery, reduce the value of our assets and not fulfil the Council's priorities, aims and objectives as set out in the Council's Asset Management Plan and Corporate Plan. OK, Ollie. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chair. Sorry, yeah, I think this is, um, I, I called this, I've just got one question which um, may actually relate to uh, um, a, a capital program rather than this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, yeah, the, the, we um, raised for the general fund £365,000 from the sale of the Hollingbury um, library site to the HRA, and there's a paper later about that. Um, I remember seeing that figure in a paper a while ago. I don't see it in this um, Program and I don't remember seeing it in, in recent capital programs either. So the, the £365,000 going back into library um, maintenance um, as, as a one-off capital figure, um, I, I just um, wonder if, if Andrew knows anything about that, if she could say something about it. Apologies if it's not entirely relevant to this paper. No, it's not relevant to this paper. It's, it's separate, sorry. <laughs> um, but the Wellington House one, yes, you're right, there was an appropriation, and then we've um, supported some more of the funding that's required for the learning disability services through the Work Styles programme. Phelan, did you still want to come in? And then I've seen Joe. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Angela. Um, I've read the... Um, Appendix to read um, the different categories for repairs and so on, and, and I wanted to raise some specific ward queries and just wondering when does this pot of money become available because I've raised it in other places but um, the state of some of these shelters on the seafront, a number of them in my ward have broken windows, broken um, chairs and so on, broken backs especially of the wooden sections of the shelters. The other was um, a query around um, the railings that are actually on Brunswick lawns themselves, I'm not sure if they have us. Not, not the railings for the actual seafront, but railings on the lawns themselves. I've raised this at TDC. They're in a really, really bad state. Um, they aren't listed, they're not recorded anywhere else, but they're in a really, really bad state. And I can't remember the type of iron they're made from, but it means it's very stiff and they always crack. Wrought iron railings. Um, I'm wondering if I can just appeal. I do realise that it's an enormous amount of money that, that we'd have to go for those railings. But if there can be anything done to um, stop the amount of environmental damage that's happening to them, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Yes, we are actually. Can I, sorry, can I just get. I didn't know whether anyone else can help us. Is it raw iron or cast iron that's stiffer? Cast is, cast is more brittle, certainly, but it depends what you're defining as stiffer in terms of material science. Right. Sorry, Angela, carry on. Um, on the seafront, yes, this money becomes available at the beginning of the financial year. 
So we are concentrating on the seafront. As you can see, there's quite a lot of money being put into the seafront, the shelters, the railings, etc. We recognise that it's in a bit of a state and that, that we will be concentrating on that. So you will be seeing that. In terms of your question about the lawns and things, I'm not quite sure I can answer other than... Um, I can't seem to find anything particular. Oh. Ah, there's railing replacement around the Region 3 Square War Memorial. So I'm concentrating on that area, Bellum. Um, and I think that's the only one. Because the, 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 the amount of money we've got in that area is for cemeteries, crop towers, Kipling Garden Walls, Milo Pavilion, Oldstein War Memorial, Parks Residential, Preston Park, and then the Regency Square War Memorial and the railings and the Waterley, Waterley Street Arch repairs. So it's a small pot, I'm afraid, so we have to be very careful how we pri prioritise it. OK, so Joe. Yeah, this is a question that Andrew raised. Um, I was just wondering whether the budgets, uh, these budgets have decreased as the council's um, ownership of properties has decreased, whether the budget's kept in line, whether, they're, whether it's remained stagnant. And the second question is um, in relation, on page 53, 3.5, it says asbestos management, 15,000. And then on page 59, under a different budget, it's got asbestos testing and surveys, 22,500. Is there a reason why it's asbestos? Yes. Okay. I'm sure you enlighten us. On, on the budgets, they've remained rough, roughly the same, actually, but they are so small for what we've got to deal with. Um, in terms of the um, capital funding, that's capital funding for the asbestos management, so that's 15, okay? The other is revenue funding, but we do join the two together and do works together. It's just from different pots. Okay, I've seen no other indications, so I'm going to take us back to the um, back to the recommendations on page 51 that's recommendations 2.1 little 1 little 2 and little 3 all those in favor excellent that's fine that seems to be everyone waving or saying okay so that takes us to item 142 educational capital resource and capital investment program 2019-20 and i am aware that there's been an amendment from the conservative group so i'll get uh, Pinnocky to introduce the report and then we'll move on to the amendment. Thank you, Chair. I will be very brief. Um, this is a report that uh, was previously considered by the Children, Young People and Skills Committee uh, on the 4th of March and some of the figures uh, contained within it were contained within the uh, report that went to Budget Council in terms of overall capital. It's a report uh, relating both to capital investment and also the maintenance programme for schools and other educational establishments and you'll see the detailed figures in the report and particularly in relationship to the maintenance program uh, you'll see a list of the various different uh, schools and buildings across the authority uh, and indicative um, allocations by section to that. Sitting behind that is a lot more detail around uh, our assumptions around the cost school by school but we don't typically publish that because we are going through a procurement process for each of those works. Uh, on the capital program you will see reference to uh, both uh, section 106 and also to the basic needs uh, funding and that particularly relates to a program of works which uh, is recommended uh, for our special educational needs uh, hubs, uh, the three hubs uh, across the city and that's a total figure of £12 million. Um, happy to answer any questions and if there's any technical questions which I'm unable to answer I'm very pleased that I've got Julian Churchill behind me who will be more than able to answer those questions as well. Thank you. Okay, any questions before we move on to the amendment? Ollie. Uh, thanks, Chair. Just a couple of um, details I'm interested in. Um, 3.12, 3 the um, services school buyback option for the strategic property function. Um, 
What's what's the nature of this funding? Is it, I mean, it, it looks like it's expected to be a, a, a recurrent pot of money which which we charge to schools in return for property services. So is 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 that then? Yeah, is, is it recurrent money? Is it is it? Does it have to be earmarked to to this work, or are we just choosing to um, put it in this part of the budget? And uh, a question right at the end of the paper um, related to uh, condition related work. There's um, there's a significant figure uh, for fees there of 10%, which adds up to about £400,000 or so, I think. Um, to whom are those fees payable? Um, I'm just interested that we didn't see a, a similar percentage figure related to the Asset Management Fund in the previous paper. Thanks. Uh, I'll answer the first question for fees. I will need to refer that to, to Gillian. Um, we previously held an amount, amount of money within the Dedicated Schools Grant, which was uh, um, allocated centrally. Uh, last year, we delegated that money to schools, and they have chosen to buy back the support from us as a council centrally to do the work uh, within the school. So this will be a decision that schools will make on an annual basis. Uh, I think, if I remember correctly, I think all the schools have chosen to buy back that provision. So, so it will be a recurrent figure. Uh, going forward. It's not a one-off amount of money. In relation to fees, I'm going to need to ask Gillian to respond to that. Um, in respect to the fees, the fees are, pay, are paid to the in-house surveyors that we have working in property and design because um, we have to engage surveyors to do the work, so we engage our own surveyors, and our own surveyors are um, fee-earning, so we have to pay their fees. Okay, I've seen no other questions, so I'm going to move. Tony, do you want to move your amendment? Thank you, Master Chair. Um, yes, formally like to um, move the, the Conservative Group Amendment to item 142. I'm um, just very briefly speak on it. The, we, we're thoroughly in favour of the spending. We don't. We don't. There's no sort of. Um, there's no tricks here. Um, obviously, we're, we're Conservatives. We believe in a mixed economy, but there's certain groups in society that we think absolutely should be looked after in in the most way we can. And so, what we'd like, we, we believe that um, that additional funds are needed for the Downsview School. Uh, we're also slightly worried that the central hub is a bit, um, what's the word, the current phraseology, nebulous at the moment, I think is the, the word that's going around. So we've, we've put this amendment forward. Genuinely, we are trying to be helpful. We're trying to give a big hint to officers to come back with some more money. So, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that um, everybody can agree to this amendment so that we can come back to the, the next committee with the, uh, with the funds required. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tony. Steve, I believe you're seconding the amendment. Oh, it's Joe. sorry, Joe, is it you? Yeah, I'll uh, second reserve my right to speak. Very good. Oh, le late Les. Well, so I thought someone else indicated before me, that was all. No. I thought you, did you reserve your right? My hearing's not too good today. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Chair. Well, I think, I think we can accept this amendment. I mean, I, I think it's a little bit um, ahead of itself because it does say quite clearly, if you look through the report here, it does say that um, there continue to be discussions about the final design specifications of the hubs. And whilst there may be some variation in the final cost of each of the two hubs, the state of the total amount required will not exceed the £8 million allocation. I don't know whether it will or not, but the point is that... Um, that we had five million pounds originally for this, and it's now going up to eight million for the east and the west, and therefore, consequently, um, it, 5.3 for the downs one and 2.7 for the other. And I don't know that may prove to be enough. I don't know. But as you rightly say, it may come to more than that. And obviously, I'm sure we would all say we wanted the job to be done properly. So therefore, I think on that particular case, there's no reason we can't, we can't accept this. I would just add that I understand there was a very successful meeting yesterday held between the council and uh, and Downsview School. And I think it made positive progress. And obviously, I'm hoping that this will come out to a satisfactory conclusion in the not too distant future. But as I say, we will accept this. Thank you. Gary. Chair, Chairman, I'd just like to ask, has there been an adoption of new standing orders? Very good. It's 
there's, there's nothing in the standing orders that precludes people from standing, Councillor Pelser Dunn, only, only at times that you are required to stand. That's all councillors have to stand in committees option. Yeah, it's optional in committees, I'm told. Mm. I, I'm guessing a dance would be optional as well, but I, I don't expect you to stand for me, Gary, ever. I'd like to stretch my legs occasionally, Chef. Excellent. Can I, can I just say, I, I, I found, this, found this amendment quite interesting because it, was, it agrees a minimum budget for spending on stuff, and usually from Conservatives you get a maximum budget for spending on stuff rather than an absolutely you've got to spend £12 million on it no matter, no matter what. But the, I understand the intention of the, of, the, of the amendment, and I think it's a perfectly proper thing to bring forward. Councillor Miller. Yes, um, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Wills for the work he's done um, on this. I think that his concern was we're putting the cart before the horse a little bit because I, my understanding on, on the SMH hub is that we haven't even identified its permanent location or, or what it's going to be, but we've allocated funding to it. And he was questioning whether disposals, I think it's, there might be a disposal at the Pruitt Pifton. Um, whether, you know, I, we need to assess exactly where it's going in order to assess how much it needs to be spent I mean, in order to allocate the budget. You can't allocate the budget. Because the most important thing here, Chair, as you've alluded to, is, is the needs of the children involved and you, you know, making sure that the budget it meets those needs rather than rather than just setting a maximum budget, as you alluded, we do. Um, and it's key for uh, Downs View School that they, they have the correct facilities um, in order to to um, work with some of the most vulnerable children in our city. Um, apart from that, um, I second the amendment, I just note that there's, there is £2 million of Section 106 which remains unspent at Appendix 5, um, I believe, um, and there appears to be, at Appendix 3, a significant amount of funds which remain unspent, and I have raised these concerns at Children's before, and I don't know if the officer, whether officer capacity doesn't exist in order to spend, but going around some of the schools in our city, I, they, aren't in, they aren't in the best shape, and if we've got this money sitting here which could be spent, I think we do need to start spending a bit quicker. But uh, it's strange, it's strange, coming from Conservative Chair, she just moved. Anyway. Okay, we'll come back to that as a question then. Um, in relationship to your comment, um, there's, it's, it's appropriate, I think, for us to hold some money uh, in reserves because there's a range of things that take place within schools and there, there are a number of discussions and early kind of plans to still sort of formulating around the future of the school estate. So that's the reason why we keep some money back. The report also refers to um, uh, a survey of um, the school estates, particularly particularly the, uh, the, the surroundings of schools and school estates. So we do need to see where that survey takes us, what that recommends in terms of cost. So it's, a, it, it's normal to not spend all of the money, but to have some of it sitting there. Uh, and indeed, um, if we need to spend more than 12 million, then we need to find the money to spend more than 12 million. Okay, I'm going to move the amendment to a vote then. Tony, did you want to use a right of reply? Nobody's spoken against. Fine, thank you. All those in favour of the amendment, please show. Nobody against, that's fine. So all those in favour of the recommendations as amended. Excellent, nobody against. Thank you very much. Items 143, 144, which was withdrawn, 145 and 146 aren't being taken because they were either weren't called or were withdrawn, so that takes us to 147. Microsoft Enterprise Subscription Agreement renewals, which we can't agree because there's an amendment to it, no matter how much you try. Dave, I think you're probably introducing this one. Um, so hopefully this is reasonably um, self-explanatory, although the way that um, Microsoft sells its licenses is, is slightly um, opaque in the way that we normally procure things in that they sell through what, what we call resellers, which is effectively an agent. Um, so the, the requests are that we are able to award reseller contract to Phoenix for the reasons outlined in the report. and that. Subsequently, we were able to approve license award to Microsoft 
Um, now, the distinction between the costs here and previous is th these are running costs, whereas the previous related to capital investment. So a few things to note. Um, on the downside, um, members will know that prices have gone up, and it's uh, mainly due to exchange rates, actually. So Microsoft set prices based on um, uh, a sort of package of six or seven different currencies. And I, 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 the sterling has obviously moved since 2015. Um, on the positive side, we're still looking to sweeten the final deal as set out in um, paragraphs 3.9 and 3.10. Um, and there are also increases in functionality that we will get from these new licenses, which will allow us to curb costs elsewhere. We're not absolutely specific about how much that is, and, and happy to uh, write a committee on the back of where we actually end up. And then, you know, hopefully there's some assurance as well, as in as set out in uh, the paper that we will obviously monitor the performance um, and then section four sets out that we did look at alternatives uh, as we always would because you don't just want to get trapped um, in a, a sort of everlasting relationship with the, the, the supplier who clearly does have a lot of a lot of market power uh, so, so that is that is the report in, in, in a very brief summary um, I, I've obviously have seen the amendment so I don't know how you want to handle that Okay, I'm looking for questions and comments at the moment before we move to the amendment that's been moved. Ollie. Yeah, I mean, just a quick question, Chair. Thank you. Um, this, this did come to PAB on, on uh, Monday. I, I, I didn't attend PAB on Monday, unfortunately, but I did, I did uh, put some comments in. I imagine there was some conversation about um, this particular item. Uh, uh, for, for the purpose of this committee, it, it, it might be useful to um, see some of PAB's conversation about um, major procurement items such as this to help guide our decision making. I know it's very short notice between that meeting and this one. Uh, yes, we can absolutely share that. Um, the, the timings of PAB and this meeting this time are slightly unfortunate because obviously usually we like a bit of a time lag between PAB and coming here. Um, PAB was content with this proposal, which is just very high level assurance, but we can um, obviously share the comments on, on the back of that meeting. I'm not even sure if the minutes are out yet, actually, but we can, uh, but we can certainly share those. Okay, so moving on to the, uh, moving on to the amendment. I've not actually looked to see who's moving the amendment, but I'm, I'm guessing it's Councillor Sykes. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, well, I mean, we have the paper in front of us. I think there, there were, um, in, in the PAB paper, there was a bit more detail, and there's some reference to a, a major review of uh, this um, requirement of the Council, it'd be our, our basic software requirements, um, in, in 2015, um, which was uh, interesting. And um, the, uh, the, 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 the tone of the paper, to me, is it's, it's, it's as much uh, about uh, uh, well, it, it's, it's, it's about the difficulty of extracting ourselves from uh, Microsoft as much as anything else. Yeah. So yeah, there, there, there are a few sort of positive reasons and lots of sort of almost sort of negative reasons for continuing with Microsoft, which which made me sort of question why why we're going forward with this. And um, there are other alternatives out there. The, the PAD paper did talk about those, that's what this 2015 uh, review was about. Um, other authorities have tried other ways forward. Camden Council used open source data. Yeah. Uh, Ada and Worthing have tried Google Docs. Um, Sorry, Hull Council have saved a million pounds by using open source software. English County Council saved millions switching to G Suite and Chromebooks. Um, so, I mean, there are other experiences out there. Um, and if we were to use those, yeah, alternative approaches to our um, basic office software. £900,000 a year buys a lot of internal developer resource and support resource to support a, a much potentially much cheaper uh, way forward with, with our basic um, office software. So um, I didn't want to 
vote against this paper and you know, look for a different way forward now. But I, I, we, we do want to you know, raise a flag, raise an issue about, about this now, and um, that's what the amendment is about. It, it, it's asking our executive director to think about this. With you know, three years is going to go by very quickly. So um, look at what was done in 2015. Things will have changed since 2015. Uh, can we go forward in a different way? And maybe uh, you know, not make a. You know, it's difficult to make a sudden transition, but over a period of time move to a different way forward that doesn't entirely rely on a single expensive supplier. You know, some, some of the material we uh, got from a brief bit of research before this meeting talks about the stranglehold that Microsoft has over uh, government uh, bodies in particular. Um, and yeah, more trials are needed so end users at least have the opportunity to experience something other than Microsoft. They might perhaps realize that different doesn't necessarily mean bad. So um, can we start thinking about this now with a view to maybe trying something different in a couple of years' time? I've had the executive director wish to reply, so. Uh, oh, should I not be replying to the... I was just going to give an officer view of the you, you, you indicated, and it's, it's requiring, giving you authority to do stuff, so. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, the, the amendment, just from an officer point of view, not precluding any political choice, the amendment is, is, is helpful, and we think we should be doing, I mean, we, we would be doing what you're suggesting in, in some shape or form through technical options analysis and procurement, but I think having um, it nailed to a uh, that, you know, a committee decision, if that's the way you want to go, would uh, bring us back and be very transparent about why we are going down the next route, perhaps earlier in the process, because we are quite up against it at this time, which is not, not ideal. So from an officer point of view, you suggest, the suggestion from Councillor Sykes is helpful. Excellent. I've seen, I've failed him, I'll get it to a second, and then I've seen Tony indicate already he wants to get in on this. Thank you, Chair. Well, I'm not really sure I need to say anything after the Executive Director's comments. Here He's more or less advising all of us to do this. Um, I think Ollie was really clear, actually. Um, some of this, yes, is um, virtually political. I know that we raised this in our time in administration about why on earth should one uh, operating system have a monopoly when it consistently is so expensive and actually not necessarily always uh, able or capable of putting the needs of what we require out of technology first. Um, but the other thing is that um, we have a, a mul you know, multitude of examples around the local government family now that are saying that this isn't only cheaper um, and in the time of um, austerity that's always a good thing, but it's also doable. And some of these are, you know, some of these aren't little districts or places where you can um, keep economies of scale very small. You know, Camden is doing this, which we look to a lot of the time as a comparator council for so many other services. So this is doable, uh, it's quite sensible, um, and I think um, looking forward, we should always be looking at what way our services are run and what way we can save money and what way we drive value for money through the contracts that this council signs. So I recommend it to you. Thanks. Tony. Thanks, Chair. I'll be brief. Um, as somebody almost 30 years ago who preferred Linux to DOS 5, and I was a Lotus Suite user instead of Microsoft Office and Netscape instead of Outlook, I tried to keep Microsoft off, to my, off my PC as much as possible. However, there's a little thing called open database connectivity, and there's networking, and, um, and it used to drop off, and it was just a nightmare. And if you've got 4,500 employees who are all trying to integrate their systems to uh, to say, I mean, you, I think you made a mistake there, you said open source data, which is a different issue altogether, but I think you're talking about open source software, really. Um, so open source software, um, I have dabbled at this. It's a nightmare. I, I think if um, if you introduce it into large organizations that you're asking for trouble, it may be cheap to buy, but by God, it's going to be expensive to maintain and train people. Um, however... However, the power of competition is a wonderful thing, and I'm, I'm glad the Greens have finally, after all these years, oh, come over free market. Yeah. To, the, to, the, to the conservative ways of thinking. The, the application forms are in the post. 
the, um, we believe in contestable markets, we don't believe in monopolies, um, and by just investigating some open source um, software, I'm sure if it proves beneficial, just like any market, it will take over from Microsoft and everybody within five years will be using um, open source software. So thank you very much to the conversion with the Greens to the market economy. It's a wonderful thing to hear. Um, let's see when, um, when we're in administration next year, they'll be supporting us on every single item we bring forward for competition in the council. So thank you very much. But I think we will be supporting this amendment, but only because, not because we'd like to see the council go full throttle into open source software, but it's just so that if something comes up and you, you've got a department that can use it, we'll go ahead and use it. If there's somebody maybe wants an initiative that they do it at home or something, they think, oh, we can use that, and it's a third of the price and they're using it, well, then use it, I believe, in um, in contestable markets, and, and can I just, w once again, I am shocked that the Greens have finally come over to the Conservative way of thinking, I just have a Conservative application for here, for you, if you'd like to fill it in for us now, so thank you very much, Chair. Join them while you can, Phelan. They may not be around for much longer. So, let's... Um, I, Ollie, did you, nobody's spoken against you. Did you want to use your right of reply? Okay, that's fine. Let's move, let's move to the uh, proposals, which were... I've completely lost what page I'm on now. Which are on page 147 of the agenda. So... Amendment. Sorry, 148, as a, and we'll take the amendment first. All those in favour of the amendment, please show. That's, that's unanimous. So all those in favour of the, of the recommendations, as amended. And that's unanimous. Thank you very much. That takes us to item 148, the Local Transport Plan Capital Programme for 2019-20, and that's on page, what, page 159 of the agenda. And I think Mark's here. Yeah, I saw Mark sneaking earlier to introduce this. Thank you, Chair. This committee has been asked to recommend a programme of investment based on government funding for 2019-20 and to also note indicative future allocations for 2020-21 after being recommended to come here by ETS Committee on the 19th of March. The proposed programme of funding consists of a number of sums of money most of this, just over £5.1 million, is received as part of the Local Transport Plan, or LTP, uh, and was considered and approved at Budget Council last month and included within the Council's budget book and medium-term financial strategy. That figure is also supplemented by other sources of government funding from the Department for Transport, which are currently made available separately and annually to local authorities, as outlined in paragraph 3.3. We have yet to receive formal confirmation of either of these relatively smaller sums for 2019-20 from the Government, and therefore the programme includes estimates of what those sums could be, amounting to £629,000. Officers will notify the Committee when we receive confirmation of those allocations, and it is expected that they will form part of the quarterly financial updates for TPM reported to PRNG Committee. The government funding allocations have also been supplemented this year by an additional £1 million, which was agreed at Budget Council last month, which means that a total of £6.798 million has been allocated to various projects and programmes for 2019-20. Proposed detailed allocation of the £6.798 million for 2020 and also plan investment for 2020-21 is set out in Appendix 2 on printed pages 171 and 172. I'll finish by highlighting a number of points regarding those allocations. As you can see from the bottom of the table on page 172 and the growing length of the footnotes on the programme, the combination of the funding sources does add an element of complexity that results in a proposed overall capital investment in transport schemes and programmes in 2019-20 of just over £20 million. And finally, the programme will continue delivering the objectives of the local transport plan which, come, which cover a number of the wider objectives of the City and the Council and the Greater Bryant City Region, which recently identified transport and travel as one of its five-year strategic priorities. The programme will therefore benefit the City's residents, businesses and workers and visitors. There are over 30 individual allocations and these investments will help to support economic growth, reduce carbon emissions and increase road safety and the health of individuals and local neighbourhoods. I've only run out here with me to help with any detailed questions. Thank you, Chair. 
Okay, I've seen Ollie so far. And let other people know to indicate. Okay, Phelan, I've seen you and I've seen Tony now. Thank you, Chair. I've just got one question um, um, in relation to uh, paragraph 3.9. Strengthening uh, highway structures, and, and particular reference to Shelter Hall and the A259, uh, and this is something that uh, again came up in Procurement Advisory Board on, uh, on on Monday in relation to a tender for um, highway structures and seafront uh, coastal structures, and uh, it, it just struck me in the in the PAB paper and in this that um, with, with our seafront structures, and in particular in Shelter Hall, where we we, we, we had the A259 slipping into the sea effectively and that's why we had to you know pump a huge amount of money into that project to basically support uh, that main road uh, on, on our on our seafront and um, I, I just wondered um, as someone who works for the environment agency when I'm not here whether we, we've made adequate um, uh, paid adequate attention to the potential use of flood defense grant in aid as a lead local flood authority to support our coastal structures instead of resorting to the uh, local transport plan money. I mean, if, if that money is there from central government, it's for coastal defences, and our, our, our seafront road is falling into the sea, it, it, you know, why aren't we using FTGIA? Thank you. I can see Councillor Mitchell nodding enthusiastically when you suggest not using transport money for, for propping up the seafront. Uh, Mark. Thank you, Chair. Um, Primarily, the, uh, the secret arches are a highway structure. They, they are supporting the A259, so that's probably the, the first port of call to, um, to secure any, any funding that would uh, look to uh, maintain that structure and keep the highway uh, in operation. Uh, we could uh, explore other options. We could look at um, flood defence grind and aid. Um, indeed, we, we did um, bring, bring forward a DEFRA scheme uh, to repair the, um, the stabilise the cliffs east of the uh, the marina and behind ASDA at some point, so that's something that, that we can explore further sort of through the committee process. Thank you, Chair. Well, one sort of small point of detail, I had the uh, pleasure of going around the shelter while it was being built and saw the, sort of the huge structures put in there to support the A2 partner. and one of the points, uh, one of the things that we discovered when we were building that was the old sea walls. So there's, you, you, what, you, what, you, what you generally find is you know, there's a seawall here, there's a seawall here, there's a seawall here. So we sort of built through the old seawalls, which sort of seems to indicate to me that they, you know, it, it is a grey area about is this, a, you know, is this a highway structure or is this a sea defence structure? So, I mean, I think it's an argument worth making. Jill, I think you want to come in on that. Uh, yes, it's just, just to add that a while back we did put in a couple of bids to the local enterprise partnership for shore and port for flood mitigation, flood defence works that would have protected businesses at the port. And I believe I am right in saying that the Environment Agency was also going to be part funding that. But unfortunately our um, application to the growth fund did not succeed, but we will be keeping on the case and perhaps uh, reapplying. And just to add to that, I think I heard this week that there's been some changes to some of the flood defence funding so that it's more available for supporting defending businesses and, and rather than other structures and other bits of, of infrastructure. Other than just 100% um, focus on housing. Okay, I'll fail him next and then I saw Tony. Thank you, Chair. Um, I am just going to echo the comments of um, my colleagues on ETS and just raise a question um, about the transport block allocation. So in 3.5, we are reminded about um, better, cycling, better cycling infrastructure and so on. And I'm just wondering um, if that is going to be reflected in the integrated transport block allocation in terms of funding itself. Has it been skipped up appropriately as well, I mean? Thank you. Sorry, Councillor McCafferty. Um, I'll, I'll pick up that question. Um, I, I didn't quite follow um, the references you're making to the text in 3.5. I wonder if you could just, um, just repeat that for me. Of course, I will, Andy. Um, in 3.5, we talk about the investment will also contribute to the development of better cycling infrastructure within the city cycle network and so on. But if you recall, um, as per some of the budget amendments as came forward, um, 
the new budget for the LTP, which included 700k for study parks, included um, 1 million for LTP. Of that, 300k went into the maintenance block, 700 went into integrated transport block. And I'm just wondering, of the money that went over, is there going to be the uh, cycling infrastructure? Is it definitely there, I suppose, is the question. So, um, so, so within the report uh, in, in Appendix 2, uh, the allocation of the additional uh, £1 million that came through Budget Council uh, is illustrated by the, the grayed out cells, so it was uh, allocated across those, those broad headings. Um, so uh, in, in terms of siding walking infrastructure, um, there's additional sums in for uh, pedestrian crossings and walking network. And then what we will be looking at uh, in terms of the future and specifically for cycling infrastructure is once the development of the local cycling and walking infrastructure plan has been completed, that will give us a further list of, of prioritised improvements that then further investment can be worked to uh, in 2021. Um, I wasn't going to list all of the, the, the growth of sales, but as Mark's just pointed out, there's also additional funding that's been put into cycle parking um, and investment in uh, intelligent transport systems uh, in terms of traffic signals, which are provision for uh, vehicles and for people to move across, uh, including cyclists. There will be uh, benefits associated with that increased investment as well. Tony, I think you had some questions or comments. Bit of both, thanks, Chair. But I'll be very brief. Um, paragraph 312, a million pounds budget council allocation. Nobody thanked the Conservatives for finding that money yet, but it'd be very well spent across the city. I'm sure um, I'll, I'll receive um, many thanks from all of you in a moment. Um, the other thing is, I noticed in 327 that um, it looks like we're still pushing on with the economic value destroying removal of the aquarium roundabout. I would love to have seen that out. I think that's um, the only comments I make. Thank you very much, Chair. I didn't hear any questions in there. Just some hopes and dreams. Um, well, it wasn't a question to officers. It's an officer report. It's not fair for the officers to thank you, Tony. Um, Right, I'm going to move on then to the recommendations as made, unless Councillor Mitchell had anything else to add. Okay, so the recommend, recommendations as, as sat out on page 160, which is 2-1 and 2-2 for the Policy and Resources Growth Committee, the second set of 2-1 and 2-2. All those in favour, please show. All those against? And all those thanking Tony. <laughs> It won't all be spent on removing the aquarium roundabout, Tony. Um, okay, moving on. Okay. Item 140, 149, homeless move on the facilities and the homeless, the Hollingbury Library proposals, as set out on page 175 of the report of the agenda. And I think this must be Larissa. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report has been to Housing and New Homes Committee. Um, there is one thing in the report that, that can be updated. Um, in the report, you'll see that we say that we're going to start consultation in April. Um, we are aware that now that, that is PERDA. Um, so when we will actually start consultation in May after the election. So uh, it's not part of the recommendations, but just to update members, that's something that we've agreed that we will do. Um, this is a, the current, uh, well, the previous use of this building was uh, the Hollingbury Library. This was sold to the HRA, and we are looking at using that building uh, to create a scheme to provide a homeless move-on accommodation. Um, a lot of that's been agreed by Housing and New Homes Committee. However, we are asking uh, that this committee approve an indicative budget of £2.75 million financed by HRA borrowing. Um, 
um, and uh, this will enable the Homes England funding to form part of that, which will enable us to complete this um, scheme. So if anyone has any questions on that, the other parts have already been agreed by Housing and New Homes Committee. Okay, Councillor Bell, I've seen you indicate. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I just say, first and foremost, I mean, it's a great idea. I mean, this is what we do need. Um, it, it's something which we should be looking to do more of, and I appreciate that, we, you know, I've even crossed party, and I don't think any of us would disagree on that. I do have some questions and some, some queries, so please bear with me. Now, there are a few, and I think probably, obviously, you're going to be answering our issue. So there we go. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm going to probably, I'm going to jump about, and I apologise for that. It's how I've sort of um, come across the question. So if I go on to page 181, which is 811, first of all, um, the question basically is if the scheme did not go ahead as a supportive move on scheme, a firmer report discussing this, m my question is why wouldn't the scheme go ahead? So I'm just a bit confused because we um, actually have put a statement there saying if it did not go ahead. So I would like to know what the other alternatives may be on that, please. The, the next one is on 8.9, um, where it says Health and Adult Social Care have allocated a budget for 150000 for 2019-20. Um, what happens 2021, etc., etc., and ongoing? Um, unless there's something I've missed, I, I can't see what's going on. And is this finance thing coming out of a different budget? Then on number three, um, obviously the money is coming from the HRA to purchase the building, which I, I totally understand. Is this a long-term purchase? Um, is it going over to the adult social care budget for, you know, for purchasing back, or where's the rent money's going? Um, I'm just not really sure of the direction of travel with the mixture of the HRA and the adult social care. Then aiming on the sort of the housing allocation and the adult social care allocation, I believe there's two separate housing allocations of um, who and what the connections are. With housing, it's five years, I believe, and this is where I need corrective, adult social care is only one year. So I'm wondering, I wonder which housing policy will people be allocated, bearing in mind it's money from the HRA. So does that mean the allocation will come from the um, Housing New Homes Committee allocation policy, or does it come from the adult social care policy? Then... Shall we can. take them in batches? Yeah, no, I'm happy to do that. Sorry, I'd, I've got my notes, so it's easier for me. Yeah, yes, yeah it's, easier, it's easier for some. Okay, yeah. I'll get no, Marisa to answer some of those. I'm happy to pick up the question uh, about paragraph 8.9. Okay, so, so if I pick up 8.9 first, well, of course, Health and Adult Social Care, unlike like every other part of the council, doesn't know what its budget for 2020 and 2021 and onwards is going to be. The Chief Finance Officer talked earlier about the fact that we're going to be doing another four-year you know, sort of plan for, for financing. So there, as I said at full budget council, there are no budgets set for, for future years. So this is just indicating what their plan is for their existing year coming, for, coming forward. And then future budgets will be set as part of that four year future planning cycle. I have no problem with that. I'd just like to see that the next four year cycle would still come out of the adult social care budget. I don't believe that says that there. That was my question. Really. Yeah, no, I, I, I'll take that. It doesn't say that there, but I'm certain that that would be the intention. Right, I'll hand over to Larissa for all of the clever stuff. So what happens if we don't use it for this? Um, well, the first thing that happens is we lose the funding, but it is then a piece of a building that the HRA owns. So the HRA could then decide to knock that building down and build something else on it. They could decide to turn it into a sheltered scheme, you know, it's an asset that the HRA owns. The big risk is, is twofold. One, this is the third site that we've tried to spend this funding on, and both other sites have been rejected. Um, 
for, for, for quite UK reasons, but um, we do need to spend this money. So, uh, and that's the first thing. And the second thing is, as you said, in your, you, we do desperately need this accommodation. So if we don't do it, we don't lose. The HRO still has that land, that still has that building, but we do lose some money. How does it work? It is an HRA asset. It remains an HRA asset unless members of this committee decide to sell it back to the general fund. That's, you know, um, we provide the tenancies. We, as the council, the housing service, do that. And the support is provided by health and adult social care. So it's not that after two years we sneak it over to adult social care, we're not allowed to do that. Also, because it's in the HRA, getting things into the HRA is quite easy. Getting things out of the HRA is a lot harder. You need certain, for, there are so many units you can do it on and then you need Secretary of State's permission. So there is a safeguard around that. It is allocated under our allocations policy, but bearing in mind these are people that, sorry, our meaning mine, housing, um, but bearing in mind the people that we are putting in these or proposing to put in these, this accommodation are people that have been in our hostels for quite a long time. So they, they have that anyway. Um, so that's, that's really it. It's, it is, Adult social care um, are the people that are responsible for these, these service users at the moment. Um, what we're doing as, as the council is we are providing the accommodation. It is something that some people might think, well, how can you do that? Because you're the HRA and they're not council tenants. Um, the HRA can do it because what happens is the HRA uh, spends the money, but then gets money back, gets rents back. So therefore, um, it balances off or makes the money for the HRA. The problem comes when the HRA subsidises services that the general fund, but as, as I think was explained at the Housing Committee, that isn't the case here because money goes out, money comes in. So that's the way. The, although the, the, the um, management and the uh, support will be provided by adult social care, you'll see in the report that they're actually going to go out and get a company, uh, an external company to do that. So there is a negative impact on the, general, on the HRA or the general fund. Okay, and I'm, I'm sure we'd all agree that the, the key component of this is about the benefits to those who've been having to live in hostels for extended periods of time and actually moving into more appropriate community-driven services who can actually have the wraparound care that they need in order to maintain that tenancy, you know, sort of and, and genuinely move on but from that hostel accommodation. But it has to be said that people that require still high levels of support that might be in host hostels, um, or supported accommodation will not be eligible for this. This is low to medium uh, support. Can I continue now, Chair? Thank you very much. I just want to quote you're saying it's, it's cost neutral. Thank you. Okay, then, where's the next one? Let's be afraid slightly on that one. That's so I'm on 178, um, which is 4.2, which I know it is, is uh, slightly in adult social care, where it says it's only going to be staffed during office hours and offer an on-call service overnight for emergencies. Now, I totally understand that. My concern is for local residents, um, and I appreciate your saying within the report these are going to be people which are capable of living on their own. But my only concern is, and I don't want to go back to situations from Housing New Angels, which you know about, and other schemes which we have. We have had problems where we've not been providing the full 24 hours. Um, and I do have concerns on that. What happens if there, there is an issue? And uh, I appreciate it says there's a call service, but I don't feel that that's going far enough, and I think we should be looking potentially to do something else. So I would like some assurances on that. And then I've got two more. One's a question, one's a comment, then, Chair. Uh, it's under on 179 under 4.5. When he says about the high-level complex support needs, I want to know, 
how, who and how this is going to be assessed. I don't want individual cases, obviously. I just want to know whether this is going to be an ongoing assessment. One of the things we have seen in the past is that we are very good sometimes at allocating, but we're not that good at following up, and situations and lifestyle change and circumstances change. I want to know how this will be assessed and how it will be monitored. And then really my final point, uh, Chair, is, is a plea that no matter who forms the administration, uh, can we not please have adult social care committee brought back to this council? So I think we have sorely missed it over this last four years. Thank you. So I think um, the current proposal and the current budget level is to provide uh, not 24-hour on, on, you know, 24 on-site support. That is something that will be monitored. But the people, there is an element of the people that we put into that property, some, you know, want that independence that they don't. They're not. There's not staff on site all the time. However, this is something. This is um, this is our building. These are. You know, people that we have a duty of care to. So, if there are problems, clearly we're going to have to work to resolve them. Um, but the the way that people are allocated is by a panel. It's not just finger in the air. A lot of work is done with people before they're allocated any properties, and um, they still have support needs that are identified. We will work very closely with the provider, and if those support needs increase to a level where then they're unable to stay at that property because their support needs are too high, then we'll work with the support provider and colleagues in adult social care uh, to find alternative arrangements. That doesn't always mean moving somebody. That sometimes means changing uh, support, giving additional support out. So it isn't a case that if somebody goes through a crisis, suddenly they're out. Um, what it is, it's about often that someone's home is their grounding and taking that away from them if someone's going through crisis isn't the, the best plan. It is about working and monitoring over a longer period of time to see if there's any deterioration or to see if there's a crisis. Um, so there is, uh, as part of the, um, the, we are doing the consultation and I, prob I feel that the, the support will be something that we're asked to look at through the consultation and if that comes up then and I'll feed back to colleagues and adult social care that that's something that's been raised. But, but it is, we, we, we really want this scheme to work because this scheme will provide a really positive um, move on for people that are ready for it and for those people if we have huge problems in the scheme it won't be good for anybody and that's why we're committed to making it work. Okay, and just to come back on your last plea, Councillor Bell, about an adult social care committee, of course it's not for an administration or any potential administration to decide, it's for council to decide, it's part of the constitution, the setup of how the council is run and I think it's important to recognise that, you know, the next four years is the next four years and we'll have to be able to see who's in charge and how they, how they feel it's best run and how council determines it's best to keep an eye on things. Okay, Joe, I've seen you indicate and then turn. Yeah, I just had a couple of questions just um, reading uh, the, the report. Um, one of them was in the financial implications, it talks about the budget being 2.425 from HRA borrowing, but in uh, 8.8 .8 it talks about 2.75 being that which we're agreeing. Um, as, despite the contingency, so it's just the level, so 8.6 versus 8.8, .8, which goes on to page 181. Um, and is it still break even at both of those levels? Uh, the second question was, when was the £750,000 given by the government? And the third question um, is, is the, is the £750,000 is reducing to six ninety because of the office space? and we lose a unit, is there, which seems sort of, because we need this accommodation so much in the city, it seems disappointing that we are losing a unit, is there no opportunity, and losing money as a result, is there no opportunity to, to, to have the office, to have all the 13 units? 
So if I take that question first, yes, you could have all 13 units, but where then, you know, it's not just about, so the office isn't just about, you know, an office with a computer. It's also a place where residents come and talk to staff in a sort of an environment that isn't their room or isn't their flat. So it is actually quite important to have on-site staff in a, in a space that people can go to. So it is something that on balance is, is worth having. Um, I don't know when we, I will get the answer for you, but I don't know exactly when we got the money, but um, I think it was, I think we bid early 16 and got notified later that calendar year because it was for a five year program 2016 to 2021 I think but the the, the bidding doc the, quite often the, the the sort of bids bidding documentation etc goes out quite late from government so the, the timetable is usually constrained so that's my memory we bid in early 2016 and we would have been notified later that calendar year I think but we can confirm and your final question, uh, please bear with me. The difference is um, the, the correct figure is uh, 2425. Sorry. Yeah, so in recommendation 2.2, .2, it reads 2475. Sorry, that's an error. It should be two point. Sorry, two four two five, not two seven two. So that'd be an amendment. Okay, thank you very much for those. I suppose. Yeah, hold, can I make a couple of comments on yeah. those questions? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, I appreciate there have been difficulties in finding a site, but length, you know, this move on accommodation is really needed in the city, and three years is a long time. I appreciate that. You know, I, know, I appreciate you've looked at two sites, but you know, it would be exciting to move a little bit quicker. And I, I think it's good the government has given us the money on it um, and I, I think we also just need to bear in mind that we do need the move on accommodation that the, these people are going to move into which I know is just general housing but you know otherwise this happens all the time and people get stuck and they have nowhere to move on then you don't get the, the throughput. Um, um, on the self-contained on the 13 units it, I mean maybe we could speak to our architects and yeah, I don't that, you know I appreciate the office is needed but it's whether you can do both it was more the point um, and that's it. As we go through the planning process, as we go, we are always going to be looking to maximise the amount of space that we've got. We need to maximise it that people have, that residents have space too, that we're not putting, because that's always a cause, often a cause for uh, conflict. But certainly I completely understand your point. We sort of need something that's not taking up any space, um, but we will continue to look constantly. Thank you very much. And to come to Tony in a second, I just want to get clarity before we get too far into this about what figure we're approving. Because looking at this, we are being asked under 2.2 .2 to approve the indicative budget financed by the borrowing and the Homes England funding. And so the, the, at 3.13, that suggests that that's 3.115. So can I get clarity either, for, either from Larissa or from Dave as to whether it should be 2.75, 2.425 or 3.115? Uh, sorry, I thought the question Councillor Miller were asking was how much the borrowing was. Uh, the borrowing is 2.425, the grant funding is 690, so the total funding is 3.115. Okay, so we'll take 2.2 we'll take as, as amended for that. Yeah. And obviously the only reason that Housing and New Homes would have missed that is because it wasn't a recommendation for them, so they, would, they wouldn't have been dealing with that in quite as much depth, I'm guessing. Okay, that's brilliant. Tony, sorry. Thanks, Chair. Um, it's, I think we agree with the principles here. Um, the one thing I'm, I'm not happy with is that there's obviously been quite a few questions and I know the officers answered them. And so I think... I think I'm reading the way the committee's going, but I, I think I might vote against this because only because I want to assure myself that officers are going to keep us updated as, as the system moves along, as, as you start going through the first business plans and, and the money starts coming in because I don't think I, I fully appreciate exactly what's going to happen from this. So can I make a plea to officers? 
I think my, my vote against will be only to put my marker down to say I'm not quite sure everything's going to happen, but in the minutes, can we agree that we'll, we'll brief both ward councillors and the chair of housing with each stage as you go along with this? Because this is a very sensitive subject and uh, it would be very good if you keep them on board all the way through. Thanks. Well, that sounds like an excellent proposal for all projects, to be honest, Tony, to make sure that people are engaged and kept informed. Ah, oh, well, life doesn't always work, does it, the way we want it to. Right, OK, I, I don't think we need any particular assurance from that. It was more a statement than anything else. I'm going to move to the recommendations as they sit on page 175, and that's recommendation 2.2, as we discussed, amended, so that it says that we're recommended to approve an indicative budget of 3.115 million financed by borrowing and the Homes England funding to form part of the HRA capital programme for 2019-20. All those in favour? All those voting against to put down the marker? All those voting against generally? Okay, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we will move on to item 150, which is on page 157, the Sustainability and Carbon Reduction Investment Fund. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report sets out a proposal to use funding agreed in the 2019-2020 City Council budget to establish a sustainability and carbon reduction investment fund. This fund would address the need to reduce carbon emissions, adapt to climate change and build resilience, protect and enhance biodiversity and develop a circular economy. The report proposes how new revenue funding will be spent on developing capacity of the sustainability team to deliver pipeline of projects and initiatives, or capital funding will establish, um, this, uh, will establish the Sustainability and Carbon Reduction Investment Fund, which would de deliver citywide projects across a number of themes. The background to the report is obviously the Council has received a number of um, recent notices of motion flagging up issues around climate change and biodiversity. This resulted in the City Council in December 2018 declaring its recognition of the ongoing climate and biodiversity emergencies. The report sets out between 3.3 and 3.6 a number of strategies and activities the Council has undertaken to address some of the issues around climate and biodiversity. At February's Budget Council, a new funding allocation was made for the sustainability, energy and, and climate change in, the, in next year's budget. These allocations included a total of £190,000 in new recurring revenue funding for the sustainability team, a £500,000 one-off capital investment fund to invest in citywide projects around sustainability and carbon reduction, and £565,000 of capital borrowing in the capital investment programme to install solar voltaic panels on a selection of corporate buildings that will deliver savings. It is proposed that the revenue funding will be used to develop the capacity of the team uh, and, and enable them to deliver these projects. Um, exact job descriptions and the structure of the team will be considered by officers as part of the redesign of the affected services. The report sets out that the £500,000 capital funding is um, we used to create the fund and um, which would deliver initiatives across a number of themes including energy efficiency, renewable and community energy development, biodiversity enhancement, active and sustainable travel, green infrastructure and sustainable urban drainage, moving towards a circular and sustainable economy and healthy, sustainable and fair food for all. It's proposed that a further report outlining the process for agreeing and assessing projects delivered through the Investments Fund will be brought to July's Policy Resources and Growth Committee. Thank you. OK, I'm going to go first, because um, I, I, I don't often get to speak. Um, I think, it's in, I think it's important to state that this is, this, is a, this is a starting point on a journey that this council has to take very seriously over the next few years. You know, people may suggest that half a million pounds worth of capital investment and the investment in additional officer resource is insignificant compared to the amount that we are going to have to spend on addressing the, the challenge of climate change over the next five, ten years. But we have to start somewhere. We have to make a start, we have to make a start early and we have to signal our intention to continue to be investing from a capital and a revenue basis in reducing our carbon footprint and reducing our impact, impact on the globe. Because if we don't do that, as a city that has 
strong environmental standards and strong environmental history, then how can we expect other, other cities, other towns, other neighbourhoods around the country and around the world to be doing the same? We have to take a stand now. We have to be flagging up as early as possible what are we intending on doing, because otherwise the other question that comes back to us is, is this just somebody's, you know, sort of ego trip, you know, sort of somebody's, you know, sort of preference, and actually what, actually they can't see any purpose in it, and we have to demonstrate the purpose. I think we've demonstrated in this report, and officers have made clear that there's so much more than half a million pounds required in terms of capital investment, so many more pieces of work that need to be delivered and achieved over the next five to ten years in order to, in order to achieve carbon neutrality. That we have to, we have to be aware this isn't the end point, this isn't the end game, this is the start of a very long journey that we're going to have to be committed to as a council for a long time to come and that will increasingly become a more and more important part of our budget setting process and our governance itself. You know, we need to understand what the impact of every decision that we're taking is on our target of achieving carbon neutrality as, as quickly as possible. And I know a number of parties have political aspirations about that. This isn't, this isn't a, a, a nice to do. This is a must do. It's a must do now. Ollie. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and th thanks for your introduction to that. Um, uh, I, I didn't want to go there, but it, I mean, it, you, know, you go back a few years, and it was the Labour and the Conservatives who cut the sustainability team. Labour, Labour, quite a lot. Labour, you, uh, you... I think you'll pardon. I'll, I'll get those old members out. Order. Okay. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be selling John Burko T-shirts after the, after the committee. Anyway, that's a little sideline I'm developing. Um, yeah, anyway, I mean, look, look, I mean, just new, news this week from, from wherever you like, Nebraska, Mozambique, and a couple of weeks ago, Tanzania. I mean, you know, the, these are issues that we you can't, you can't overstate the, the urgency of these matters. And we need to work on them locally, because you know, we, we have an impact in our, in our city. And we, yeah, as, uh, as the chair said, we, we are a green city in terms of aspirations, in terms of politics, maybe, but in terms of consumption and in terms of our emissions and our impact, we are, we are um, not as green as maybe we should be. So uh, I think this, this, will, yeah, this, this work will go some way towards um, helping that. So I'm very pleased that the, the Green Amendment passed the Budget Council and I thank uh, the, the, uh, Labour for their support and, and the Conservatives for their contribution. Um, so 690,000 back into, into sustainability work. It is just a start, as, as, the, as the Chair said, but we need staff resources to do that work, to develop those projects, to get the extra money in. This, this, this is, it needs to be used to, to, to kickstart work and to, to raise resources to do uh, more together with our uh, neighbours. Uh, and I think the paper's uh, excellent, um, boosting the sustainability team and the strategic commissioning approach. We've got loads of organisations in the city who are extremely keen to get involved and get engaged in this work. Um, the, the paper mentions the, the, the biosphere partnership and also the, the food strategy. And, I, and I'd also like to mention a, uh, another sort of sometimes forgotten partner, particularly in, in the area of conservation, um, and that's the, the Sussex Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority, which uh, takes care of uh, 13 miles of our, our, our inshore waters, which are a huge part of our, uh, our local biosphere. So uh, can, we, can we work with them as well? Um, I'm extremely grateful for, for the speed with which officers have turned this paper around. Uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great start, and I'll be asking questions from the public gallery after May on progress. Thank you. Tony. Thank you, Chair. Nice to hear that uh, Ollie has acknowledged that it was the Conservatives who find, found the money for this. Um, and it was actually the Labour that decided to cut the sustainability team, and we, along with the Greens, did support that. It was, in fact, us that got the, uh, the, the, the biosphere through, um, through, through the government, so the context for us, and of course, um, I'll get ready for the jeering, but it was, of course, the first major world leader to recognise this in, in a world event, um, was, in fact, Margaret Thatcher from the Conservatives. As a scientist herself, she was the first um, major world leader to do a speech which 
um, suggested we needed to do something on climate change, so we'll take no lectures from the Green Party on that. And it's widely acknowledged that the Conservatives are government in the UK are leading the world, leading the world in, in efforts to uh, combat climate change. You just have to, I mean, you just have to put it into Google and you see, I mean, the Labour government was woefully ad inadequate. The Conservatives are doing real things on climate change. I'll take no lectures from the Greens. I'll take, certainly take no lectures from the Labour Party. Crikey, they did actually try and cover the sustainability team year after year after year. So the Conservatives found this money and I'm very pleased. I am actually very pleased that this money is going, going into this um, sustainability. My, my only, my only observation my only observation my only observation is Max, a very good report, thank you very much um, in fact it's, it's quite a good report, it's almost like you knew it was coming before Budget Council was there some sort of stitch up at Budget Council with the Labour and the Green Alliance we... Tony I'll stop you at that point because you're addressing that comment to Max and then you're using the word stitch up and suggesting that things were agreed which they weren't agreed, officers worked on this report when it was asked for after Budget Council working late into the early hours to be honest to deliver this and there was no suggestion or comment whatsoever that this was a stitch up or that officers were involved in any way in such things. Dan, careful, you give yourself an aneurysm, mate. I never, never insinuated that Max had anything to do with any stitch up. If you did that again, you're just um, cutting me off. What I was saying is that the late... And again, Councillor Janio, I remind you that pointing at people isn't a particularly polite or sensible way to behave when somebody else has the override button. If, if I may continue, thank you. I was suggesting that the Labour and Green parties had come to an alliance deal before the budget, nor that officers were involved in any way at all. I don't know what sort of imagination you've got, but it's certainly run right tonight. So, f fully happy to support this system um, tonight. Thank you very much. Councillor Mitchell, now this could be your last intervention at PRNG, so make it a good one. It could be. And um, first of all... Thank you. <laughs> I would like to start my intervention by thanking Councillor Sykes for his long and sterling service on the Sussex Inshore Marine Conservation Society. So thank you very much. And I know you've enjoyed it. And thank you for sending me the, the magazines and the brochures. So that's great. Okay. Fishing for compliments. Fishing for compliments. So <laughs> turning Turning to this report, Chair, I really, I really do welcome this and I thank Max in particular for turning this report round so quickly and I know he did work long and hard into the night on it. Um, I think it's good in that it does set out at 3.12 the broad areas um, for action which can obviously be fleshed out. I think the report dovetails with the LTP report on sustainable transport and if we actually mean what we say and if we, and I'm looking at the Conservatives here, want to be proud of any record that we may have in delivering sustainability and carbon reduction, then I think we have to follow that through and be very brave, particularly when we are seeing through an exemplar road scheme that puts sustainable transport first and foremost. One thing I would like to ask, and I'd like to ask specifically the Conservatives again, is that they direct some of their energy that they've shown here this evening towards their own government in relation to the Code for Sustainable Homes within the NPPF. Because if there is one thing that is going to hold this city back and all other large towns and cities in the UK, with their carbon reduction plans and which is seriously going to hamper us in achieving carbon neutrality by 2030, it is the fact that we can no longer demand high codes of sustainability within building regulations within our new developments. And if that one thing could be sent back to the government, if they're still listening to anybody, that is what we need to achieve in order to help us on this journey. Thank you, Chair, and I hope that point has gone in. Okay, I've seen no other, no other indication. Oh, failing. Wow. Oh, I'll always be appreciated on this matter. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's not time. Um, what was I going to say? Um, I've got a few questions. Obviously, welcome the report. Thank you, Max, 
uh, particularly at this moment in time, for being able to convert, translate, and the climate crisis into a report that actually can give us some direction. Thank you. Um, two questions. Um, the Carbon Reduction and Investment Funds, so this is the pot of £500,000. How is this likely to work in practice in terms of applications to the fund? Um, I know that I'm not alone in understanding that um, we are blessed, as a number of people have already said, um, in our city with having um, a whole load of really important environmental charities and organisations, and, and for many of them, even small amounts of money, um, will make a mass, vast amount of difference, and they are working on the ground, and we'll, we'll need to work with them, but I'm just trying to figure out how um, that fund will work in the long run. And in 7.2 in the report, it says that individual projects and initiatives will need to be approved either through targeted budget management process or separate reports to PRG. And I suppose um, one of my concerns about that would be that um, over time, especially as we approach the elections when there will be many different committee members, that we don't lose focus on this. So I'm just wondering if the work on this can carry on being talked about with one title or with one um, with one, you know, agreed set of principles or whatever else that mean that wherever this goes, if it comes to this committee, if it goes to ETS, um, if it even ends up on the Health and Wellbeing Board agendas or on the NICE committee, that there's some way in which we are able to um, keep an eye on it um, so that the important work that's been identified isn't lost. Thank you, sir. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, with regards to the second point, I, I agree that we do need to find, you know, you keep using this this title so we can track the spending. So, and I'm sure through the through the budget process we will do that. With the first point around how the actual fund works, to some extent that will be a decision for this committee in in July in terms of the detail. Um, there will be various options and ways we can do it. Um, my my recommendations, officer, would be that we don't just kind of throw it open as a fund and, and welcome bids. It will be more something where we would be curating and working with partners. It's not not every penny will be spent directly by the city council. Would be my my expectation, but we'll we'll report on that in July. Okay, I've seen no other indications, so I'm going to move to recommendations 2.1 and 2.2. Too late, Steve. And 2.3. Are you agree that one agreed as well? Okay, well thank you very much everybody. I look forward to it. Now just a very, very quick thank you. Any items to go to full council? Okay, and just to thank everybody, everyone that served on the committee over the last year as you know, as regular members or as substitutes to give my commiserations or congratulations, whoever you see it, to those who aren't going to be coming back. Uh, and just a little plea, if we could have a little bit more gender balance, that would be brilliant uh, next time round uh, from full council, because we have noticed that one side tends to be predominantly gender imbalanced. And it, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of jobs we can do there. And just a little bit of a news update. I gave an update on the waterfront at the start, at the start, and we were talking about Brexit. Well, I understand that the Theresa May's pushback of Brexit it to the end of June has already been pushed back at her to the 22nd of May by the EU, which obviously is the EU recognising that the full council AGM on the, on the 23rd is in fact the most important day in Europe and we need to have it sorted before the AGM of Brighton Hope City Council. Well, they've got to get it sorted the day before, haven't they? I know when the European elections are, which will be an issue for this council because our AGM is set for the date of the European elections. If we, if this, if, the, if we end up having European elections, I think we might have to have some issues around our AGM. 